how you have arrived at what you're doing today. Okay, yes, great question. And it's an interesting story actually as part of my whole path because uh, what I'm doing today, the sound therapy work, all started because of my mother. Because, you see, when I was growing up, my mother had a problem. Well, a few problems. She could not follow a conversation in a noisy room. So if there was any other background noise, anyone else talking, she simply could not follow what was being said. And it was really distressing for her. It meant she was socially isolated. She couldn't go to parties. She really just couldn't mix like a normal person. She was also incredibly sensitive to loud sound. So we were used to it. If we went to town and a truck went past, she'd be holding her ears and running for cover. She couldn't stand rock music or any loud music. You know, she just was a very sensitive being. Being, and we just thought, well, she was odd. Um, <clears throat> so it was a surprise to me. Some years later, when I was working in, in Paris as an au pair, I had a chance meeting with a Canadian doctor who was training. He was over in Paris training to become a sound therapist. And he told me this is what he was doing. And I said, well, what's sound therapy? And he told me a little bit about it. It sounded a bit odd, but I thought, well, my mother has these odd hearing issues. I asked him if it would help her. And I described her problems and I was really surprised when he said, oh, yes, sound therapy would fix all that. And I thought, well, that's extraordinary. I'd never met anyone who'd heard of these type of problems, let alone claim to have a solution. But I wrote to my mother back in Canada and suggested she go and, and try this because this Canadian doctor who I met, as it happened, was going back to open his clinic in Montreal the next year after he'd finished his training. And sure enough, my mother enrolled for the program and she went and had the treatment, which involved three months of going into the clinic every day and putting on these big headphones and listening to this old sort of filtered classical music that they had. And well, the results were, for her were absolutely phenomenal. She got over her um, difficulty with background noise, which, by the way, is called the cocktail party syndrome. It doesn't have any more technical name than that. And she got over her sound sensitivity. I got back from Paris and here she was putting on records of Elvis and enjoying a different selection of music. And you could talk in the room when she was there. And, and I could even fold up the brown paper bags after grocery shopping and she didn't mind. She didn't flee and say, oh, I can't stand that noise. I have to leave the room. She was healed from these sound issues. But in addition to that, she was healed from other things like her chronic exhaustion, which she'd had for years, chronic insomnia, and writer's block, which for her was the worst problem of all. Because, you know, if you've ever known a writer, um, if they have writer's block, then that just stops, every, the world stops, you know, they, they need to write. So, so that was gone. The inspiration for her writing was just flowing with this treatment. It was extraordinary. So that was the beginning of the journey of my mother and me being involved in sound therapy. And it went on from there because um, she actually, well, later she met, some, she met some monks in Western Canada, which is another interesting story. We moved out to Western Canada and there was an order of Benedictine monks there who were using the same sound therapy. Now, I didn't mention who developed this sound therapy, but it was a French ear doctor based in Paris, Dr. Alfred Tomatis, who I'm sure some of your listeners will have heard of. His, his work is very well known around the world and he's helped people with all sorts of different problems. And uh, so the monks in Saskatchewan were using the same method, which was quite extraordinary. And they helped my mother because um, they had the whole set up there. But while she was going in and listening to the music and, and you know, getting a, a top up for her ears and her brain, they came up with the idea together, my mother and the monks, of putting the program on cassette tape. Now, this was in the 80s. And we had this newfangled thing, the Sony Walkman. Do you remember? Yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, it was the first time we had good quality portable audio you know, in a small machine that you could carry around with you that actually sounded good. And they realized they could put the, the sound therapy on cassette because it was very good quality. And you needed that good quality to get the high frequencies for the therapy to work. And so they did that. And there she was then walking on the prairie with the cassette tapes and listening to it and, and thinking, oh, this is such a gift. This is amazing to have this therapy that charges up the brain and calms the nervous system and helps you sleep and makes you feel good to, to have it portable, this should be available to everyone. And so that was the, the moment of inspiration which led her to actually putting out the program as a portable system. And, and um, I followed her later in that. And, 
And we started to learn about the ear and its relationship to the brain and the amazing potential of this therapy. And so it was very much that personal connection that led me into it of initially healing my mother's condition and then us being able to help other people and heal people from all walks of life with such a great range of conditions. Because, wow, um, incredible. yeah, there's, I mean, there's so many conditions that relate to the ears and the brain. And, and what we learned is that although this therapy at face value treats the ear, the ear is actually the gateway to the brain. And it's a way of accessing the brain. And I've learned throughout the years, I've been doing this for over 30 years now. And over the years, I've learned that one of the best ways to actually heal and enhance brain function is through our own sensory pathways. And when you think about all of the natural therapies, they use the sensory pathways. They use sound. There are vision therapies. There's aromatherapy. There's color therapy. There's many tactile touch therapies. They're all using our own natural senses, even the sense of balance with, with movement therapies. And sound is one of the most profound. So instead of kind of, you know, bypassing the body's own receiving mechanisms, which are the senses through injections and, I mean, medications, you know, they're sure they're using the digestive tract, but really they're, they're bypassing a lot of our, our natural way of receiving substances. The, these natural holistic therapies are using those sensory pathways that evolved with us to be able to receive the world. And they can all be used for healing. They're not just there for us to know what's going on in the world, but they're there to actually heal the nervous system and the brain. And so with sound therapy, we're coming through the ear and the auditory system, which is a very complex system. There's so much more to it than just the ear, which in itself is very complex. But we're accessing so many different parts of the brain by bringing in a stimulus through the auditory system and so as time went on, we found out that we were really able to help people heal a very wide range of conditions through this therapy. So it's been a, an amazing journey. You know, I say I've been on a 30-year journey into the ear and I've learned about a whole range of different hearing conditions and hearing ailments. And I've learned how important the ear is for the brain. And this is really important work that um, Dr. Tomatis unveiled for us. You know, there are many types of sound therapy or music therapy. You know, people use chant and they use music to calm and music therapy in itself is a whole developed field. And then there's different instruments that are used. And, and these are all great for calming the nervous system, changing the mood, etc. Dr. Tomatis' therapy is unique because it's actually physiologically working on the ear. And so it's, it's enhancing that amazing mechanism of the ear to enable it to better serve the whole organism. And Dr. Tomatis just discovered this because he had such a curious mind. And so he worked in his lab or his studio and uh, <clears throat> he tried different things. He experimented. He was fascinated because, well, it, for him, you see, for him, where did the story start for him? That's an interesting <laughs> question to look at as well. Dr. Tomatis' father was a singer, quite a well-known opera singer at the time. And um, <clears throat> he started sending his friends to Tomatis for treatment. Tomatis became a, um, an ear, nose and throat specialist. And then his father started sending his singer friends to him and saying, can you help this man? You know, he's lost his voice. And the treatment at the time for losing the voice was a strychnine, I think, very, very strong medication, very dangerous to try and treat the vocal cords. But Tomatis thought to himself, well, I wonder if it's got anything to do with the ear, being an ear doctor. And so he started experimenting with filtering sound and playing different sounds to these singers and, you know, through the right ear, through the left ear, and he made some incredible discoveries. One of the things he discovered is that we produce sound better, the better range in our voice and better integration if the right ear is the leading ear in our listening. And so if he had these singers monitor themselves with the right ear alone, so they were 
just listening to their voice back through a headphone to the right ear. They would sing really well and their vocal range would increase and they'd be comfortable. Whereas if he had the monitor themselves with the left ear alone, they would just lose the plot, their, their voice would be um, shallow and they'd feel distressed and, and they couldn't function well. And he thought, wow, what is this? What is this connection with the right ear? And so that was the beginning of him understanding about learning and language processing and how the brain is wired so that we function better uh, if the right ear is the leading and directing ear in our listening. So that was one of his key discoveries that he made early on. Um, another discovery he made through working with these singers was that the voice only contains those sounds that the ear can hear. So if we've lost our hearing in particular frequencies, which often happens, we can't reproduce those frequencies because, you know, we're constantly monitoring ourselves. Our, we're monitoring our voice through what we hear. And if we can't hear a tone, then we kind of forget how to produce it. And what he discovered was that through the stimulation and filtering that he developed, he could restore certain frequencies to the ear so that people would start to hear them again. And when that happened, those frequencies were automatically restored to the voice. And so he pronounced what is known as the first law of tomatoes, which is that the voice contains only those sounds that the ear can hear. And these were some of his early discoveries. Uh, another key discovery he made was when he was asked to treat aeroplane mechanics. And this was just after World War II. He'd been active and he'd been a doctor during the war. And um, he was monitoring aeroplane mechanics to see how much hearing they'd lost through their work. And during the time that he was testing them, the government announced a pension fund for people who'd lost their hearing. And Tomatis noticed that when this happened, suddenly the hearing of these fellows that he was testing was a lot worse. And he thought, well, what's going on here? Is this because they want to get a pension? But he was absolutely convinced that wasn't the reason that you know, he could tell from the way they were responding to the test, their hearing was actually responding worse. And he realized there was a psychological component to our hearing. And so that was the beginning of his journey into the psychology of hearing, if you will. And he made some really, really interesting discoveries in this field, looking at how sound impact impacts us from very early on in our lives and how as we develop, we you know, the sounds that we can hear are a really important part of our, our psychological makeup and our psychological health. And one of the areas he explored was the mother's voice and the impact of the mother's voice on the child and, in fact, even on the unborn fetus in the womb. And uh, he investigated some work that had been done uh, on the eggs of songbirds where they tested songbirds who if they had not been exposed to the parents singing before they were hatched, so if they were raised by silent mothers, they would hatch and they wouldn't be able to sing. And so clearly the ability to sing was learnt in the egg. And he thought, well, then what does the babe, what language skills does the baby learn in utero? And Tomatis was the first practitioner to say, to point out that we start to hear at four and a half months in utero. Now this is fairly common knowledge and you see mothers putting a speaker on their womb and, you know, there's a read to your baby when it's still in the womb and all of this. But it makes sense because when we're developing in utero and the nervous system is developing and the organs are developing and the brain is developing, the pathways for language are being laid down when we're in utero. And... As the way that happens is through listening. The baby is hearing all the mother's sounds when it's in the womb. It's hearing her heart rate and her visceral body noises, but it's also hearing her voice coming in through the body of the mother. And so it's the actual hearing of the voice and these vocal tones that is creating the pathways for language. Now, we assume that after the baby's born, it starts learning language. That's not the case. The brain is actually built. The language pathways are actually built while the baby's listening to the mother's voice in utero. And so in realizing this, Tomatis became aware of how deeply the mother's voice is programmed into our psyche. 
It's the very building blocks of the brain. And you know how in in psychotherapy and um, what are they called, body body therapy, um, body therapies that look at the emotions, I've just forgotten the word at the moment, um, <clears throat> we look at how certain emotions can get blocked in the body and locked up in the body. And if you somehow can release that tension in the body, the memory might come back and the emotion might be freed up. And um, Tomatis realised that the same thing happens with the auditory system. So emotional traumas might get locked in the auditory memory. And this might mean, for instance, that we close down to certain frequencies. There are certain sounds that we lock away and we close down to. And so his therapy was aimed at relieving this, at opening this up, at restoring the lost frequencies. And so he developed what was called the mother's voice technique where he would actually have the mother come into the clinic and read to the child and, and he would filter her voice. So all of the sound that he used was filtered through a particular process. Uh, he developed a device called the electronic ear and the sound is filtered through the electronic ear. And so that changes the frequencies. It gives you alternating tones and frequencies that you listen to. And as you're listening, it's exercising the muscles of the ear. It's actually activating the ear. And so it's op we call it opening the ear. It means opening the receptivity of the ear and the whole auditory system for the growing baby or, or the fetus to be able to really hear the mother's voice and receive the world and be open and understanding. And if there's been some trauma in utero or after birth, that can be locked away. Um, it just puts me in mind of a woman I met some years ago who uh, had used our program and, and she told me that her grandchild, when he was two, I think it was, had a trauma where a, a car drove through the window into the house through this big glass door and the child was traumatised by this and stopped speaking. And he didn't speak for years, I think, a couple of years maybe, until he did our sound therapy program and that restored his ability to speak. He was able to reconnect to his language and she said, I don't think he would be speaking today if it weren't for sound therapy. So that's a really profound example of of restoring that connection and and opening up from the from the trauma and it does this by accessing those very very early pathways which were laid down in utero to the mother's voice so the mother's voice is like a healing mechanism that can restore ourselves and our natural nervous system and uh, it's all got to do with opening up to high frequency sounds as well the high frequency sounds so this is another one of dr tomatis's really profound discoveries is that High frequencies heal the nervous system and the ear, whereas low frequencies are quite damaging. So people may not be familiar with the term frequency and really know what it means. So a high frequency sound is simply a high tone sound like this. Ah, that's a high frequency, whereas oh is a low frequency. So it's just high tone or low tone, but frequency is the technical term. And when you think about the sounds we hear today, most of the sounds that we are exposed to in our world, unless you live in a very remote place, most of the sounds we hear are low frequency sounds. Machines. We spend most of our life being able to hear a machine. Like right now I can hear my computer making a sort of a, a humming or hissing sound. It's very rare not to hear a machine. If you go right out into wilderness in Australia, you may find a place where you don't hear a machine, but probably a plane will fly over. So it's pretty hard to get away from machines. And in our homes, we have the fridge, the computer, the air conditioner, there's traffic, there's TV and radio, there's, you know, there's machine noise most of the time. Kitchen appliances and at work, oh, at work so many people are exposed to loud noise, which is even more damaging. But Tomatis taught us that even quiet, low-frequency noise, that low harm of the fridge or the computer, is damaging and detrimental because it drains our energy and it subtly shuts down our nervous system. So what we're talking about here is, is really subtle responses to sound, activating the delicate mechanisms of the ear and activating the brain pathways and our emotional state and all of that nuance of the psyche that responds to sound. And 
our psyche responds to interesting, complex, melodic, primarily high frequency sound, those sounds actually wake us up. They're like food for the nervous system. Whereas low frequency droning machines, they just shut us down and we lose cognition, perception, brain pathways, energy, all of the stuff that natural health is designed to to increase in us. So it's very important for us to be aware of our sound environment and what we're being exposed to throughout the day. Um, the, the sounds that nature gave us are very healing. When you think about natural sounds, there's bird song, there's frogs, there's running water. All of those sounds are rich in high frequencies and complexity and overlapping rhythms and harmonies. And, and in the case of birds, there's melody. And so, you know, we're given this beautiful soundscape and we've created one that's, that's not so good with all our clever technology. <laughs> so, you know, this has been a lot of our learning about the ear, working with my mother over many years and, and learning from other people in the field and, and the works of Dr. Tomatas. It's just been a, a tremendous journey of appreciation of this incredible organ, the ear that we have on each side of our head and, and the gift that brings to our nervous system and our well-being. Wow, that's an incredible uh, story, um, Raphael. It's, uh, you know, inspiring in terms of the uh, outcomes that have been achieved through sound therapy. And I was just wondering, what are some of the other uh, conditions that you've seen a positive effect from sound therapy? Yes, yes. Well, it's been extraordinary, Anthony, what we've discovered that could be healed. We started out with finding out about the cocktail party syndrome, which my mother had. And that's, I mean, that is a really significant area, which I'll just talk about a little bit more, because it's very common. Many, many people have the cocktail party syndrome, that inability to follow a conversation when there's background noise. And I know this because I've been doing my own survey for the last 30 years. Every time I speak to a group, I ask for a show of hands, who else has that problem? Because I want people to realise my mother wasn't weird. She wasn't the only one. And always 20 to 30% of people put their hand up, even, even with younger people. So it's very common. And the interesting thing is with that condition that people can't get help for it because where do people go? Well, they go to the GP, they go to their audiologist. Now, audiologists have some, some great tools. You know, hearing aids are fantastic if you've got hearing loss, but hearing aids usually don't help with the cocktail party syndrome. In fact, many people tell us they make it worse because they magnify all the background noise and they're not as good at differentiating what you want to hear from what you don't want to hear as the natural ear, if the natural ear is working well. So it's better to retrain the natural ear and brain to be able to have that sound distinction rather than just amplifying everything with a hearing aid. Now, I will say there have been advances in recent years and, and the best advance they've made with hearing aids is that now they can focus on what's in front of you, not what's behind you. And that does help a lot because usually you're facing the person you want to hear. So that's the biggest advantage they've made in terms of sorting out what you want to hear from what you don't want to hear. But the ear and the brain working together are much more effective than that because you can actually tune the ear to select, I want to hear the particular frequencies of that particular voice. So we know that because if, if you're in a noisy room and someone across the room says your name and you happen to hear it, suddenly you're tuned into what they're saying and not the person in front of you. We can, we can tune the ear. We do tune the ear because it has muscles. I'll just, I'll just diverge for a moment and tell you about the muscles. I've got a model of the ear here, which your listeners won't be able to see, but if you're using the, the visuals, this is a model of the ear. And inside the middle ear, which is the airfield chamber behind the eardrum, which is here, there are three little bones, hammer, anvil, and stirrup. And uh, that's the hammer and the anvil there. The stirrup is, is on this piece. And those bones have little muscles attached to them. And some people will have heard of these muscles. They're called the hammer muscle and the stirrup muscle, would you believe? And you can see the hammer muscle here attached to this bone. If people go and look up an ear diagram, they won't see the muscles because they never bother to put them on the ear diagrams because in general, they haven't been thought to be very important. However, Dr. Tomatas told us those muscles are very important. The middle ear muscles, the hammer muscle, 
and the stirrup muscle are actually the tuning mechanism for the ear. That's what enables us to tune the ear in to the sounds we want to hear and not the other sounds. And if those muscles aren't working well, well, we can't tune in. So that's part of the problem that causes the cocktail party sy syndrome, tuning the muscles. So we can talk more about how we actually tune those muscles with sound therapy. So, so that's one thing that a great many people have and they can't get an answer for it. So it is, it is a huge benefit. Now, along the way, we also found out that sound therapy helps tinnitus. And we found this out by accident because you know, once my mother discovered with the monks that you could put the program on cassette and she put that program out for the world, uh, people were able to, to get the program and listen to it. And people started writing to us and saying, sound therapy has cured my tinnitus. Tinnitus, ringing in the ears. That is a terrible affliction to live with. It's very common. Um, we hear that 20% of the population has it or, or will have it at some time, which is pretty high. And uh, for some people, it's fairly quiet and they just cope with it. But for others, it becomes very loud and very disturbing. And it is a, an indication that there's something wrong with the ear. And so something should be done about it. But unfortunately, when people go to their doctor and say, I've got tinnitus, I've got ringing in the ears, the doctor says, you'll just have to learn to live with it. And if they go to their audiologist, their audiologist says, I'll get your hearing aid. Now, hearing aids, there are some people where they will make the tinnitus better, but there are other people where... They won't help or might even make it worse. So a hearing aid is not really the solution to tinnitus. So when people started writing to my mother and me and saying sound therapy is, has cured my tinnitus, we didn't realise how significant this was, what a significant discovery we actually had in our hands. And Dr Tomatis himself had really not focused on tinnitus in his work. He had focused more on learning difficulties, dyslexia, autism and general wellbeing. But tinnitus became the focus. It took us down a path. We didn't choose it. But um, when people heard that this treatment could help tinnitus, we were mobbed and still are. People come to us all the time. Our phone is constantly ringing people wanting help with tinnitus because they are told by their doctor nothing can be done. And that is tragic because then they just go and live with it and put up with it for years. And if you've got ringing in the ears, it means there's a problem. It means there's been damage to the ear or a stress situation or an injury or a chemical imbalance or pressure imbalance. There's something that's causing it. It's very hard to find the cause often. And most of the time it's noise that causes it. But I don't know, 70, 80 percent of the time it's noise. And if the ear has been damaged, it's very hard to repair that. And so, you know, doctors will say nothing can be done because if those little hair-like cells in the, in the inner ear have been damaged, it's very hard to repair that. You probably never have normal hearing again. But we have had people with that condition who've had tinnitus who've got rid of the tinnitus because what we now know and have learned in the last 20, 30 years about tinnitus is that what happens when the ear is damaged is you then get a distortion in the brain map that's taking in the sound. And so what's happening is there's a pathway in the brain where neurons keep firing over and over and over again, and that's that phantom noise you hear. And the noise you hear is just as real as an externally generated noise because if the neurons are firing, well, that's our experience of sound. But they're not firing because of an external sound. They're firing because some damage has occurred and they're stuck in the on position, firing and firing and firing. How do we unstick that firing? How do we stop the brain from firing? Well, Anthony, it's a bit like chronic pain. Chronic pain, when the injuries had time to heal but the pain is still there, is also nerves continuing to fire because of a memory or because something in the body has been damaged. And how do we stop that? Now, it's really interesting that sound therapy helps both tinnitus and chronic pain. We've had people who've had a leg injury or a nerve injury or even an amputee an amputated leg who had phantom pain, people who've had chronic pain from an old injury do sound therapy and it got better. And that's very similar to the mechanism with tinnitus. What we're doing is we're remapping the brain. We're calming the brain pathway that got set in train repeating this, this 
you know, expression of injury or, or noise trauma, and we're able to build new maps. So it's all about brain plasticity, auditory remapping. So we hear so much about brain plasticity now. We know the brain is plastic. It can be changed. And any stimulus changes the brain. Any new stimulus, the brain has to build a new map to respond to that, to understand that. So new neurons, new neural connections are created, axons and dendrites, whenever there's new learning that occurs. And so focusing specifically on the auditory system, because the sounds we create and offer with sound therapy are so complex and interesting and varied and rich in high frequency and melody and harmony, and they're really retraining the whole auditory mechanism, we are building new brain pathways. And by doing that, by activating so many different parts of the brain, it's able to then let go of that old traumatized pathway where it's kind of a rut that was going on and on with the noise and and the tinnitus will stop in most cases. I've actually, um, I wrote a whole book about tinnitus some years ago. It's only available as an ebook now. This is a hard copy, but you can get it as an ebook. Um, and Triumph Over Tinnitus, it's called. And uh, it's just been wonderful to be able to help people and to have them ring up and say, my tinnitus is gone. Even people who've had it for decades, it's extraordinary. So that's that's one of our biggest areas. So cocktail party syndrome, tinnitus, dizziness is another one. Sorry, I'm going down a whole rabbit hole with each of these conditions, but it's so exciting and it's so great to be able to do a longer interview because many of the interviews I've done have been seven-minute radio interviews. So thank you, Anthony, for taking the time to hear a bit more of the story. So another condition which we've treated with uh, remarkable success is dizziness. And there are many different causes of dizziness, but one of the most common and, and most bewildering is Meniere's syndrome. And that's a condition which people will be familiar with but bewildered by if they have it, where there's a sudden dizzy attack. So suddenly the equilibrium is lost, the world is spinning, you're on your back, it feels as though the world's falling away from you and uh, just have no control. So that's typical of, of Menier's syndrome, sudden, unexplained, dizzy attacks. And people have, of course, come to us over the years with this condition because it's an ear-related condition. And again, we've had people contact us and say, oh, my Menier's is 80 90% better. It's extraordinary. I can lead a normal life now. Uh, those terrible attacks haven't recurred. It's, it's just wonderful. And uh, there have also been people with unexplained or undiagnosed types of dizziness because there are, you know, numerous causes of dizziness, many of them ear-related, some of them blood pressure-related uh, and brain-related, but often the ear plays a big component in them. And, of course, we are working on the ear and the brain and our whole vestibular sense and our ability to uh, <clears throat> perceive the world, where we are in the world, the position of our head, the movement, tilting of the head, all of this. And uh, we are able to heal that sensory perception with the sound therapy because it's re-educating the ear, it's retraining the ear to do its job. And, and this is the extraordinary thing, Anthony, about natural and holistic therapies is that we, it's, it's an understanding of the body's, the body's ability to retrain itself. And it's very different, as I'm sure you're aware, from an approach often taken by Western medicine. You know, I went to the doctor recently and I had some um, stiffness in the back and so I, I got a scan and, and she said, oh, there's a little bit of bony degeneration there. And, and I said, well, what can be done about that? How can it be improved? She said, oh, nothing, you know, it'll just degenerate. I can refer you to a neurologist if you like, but it's normal for your age. And, and she didn't want to offer me anything. I mean, she didn't refer me to a physio or, or a nutritionist or suggest anything to, to treat the body. And, and I thought, wow, this is sad because I know there are dozens of um, treatments. And since then I've consulted Dr. Google and, you know, I'm following different programs and I've got a whole routine and I'm feeling better um, <laughs> because I know there are a thousand ways to heal the body. But it's been very narrowed, unfortunately, by the whole... Western approach, um, the pharmaceutical approach, the surgical approach, which, you know, are great when you need them, but they're leaving out an awful lot of other approaches 
And I, since I realised that it's the sensory ther, it's the sensory pathways that we use for most natural therapies. I just, I think it's so beautiful that nature gave us these. Well, more than five senses, six, seven, eight that that I can count. Um, and I talk about that in my books too. That there are more senses, and they can all be used for healing. And so, music to remap the brain. I mean, isn't that beautiful? And and it's lovely because our music is enjoyable to listen to. People love listening to it because it's classical music and it's interesting. And you know, there's hours and hours of music in the program, so you don't get bored with it. So it's a really enjoyable process of of building a solution, much better than a tinnitus masker. Uh, most people with tinnitus, if they are given anything, it's a masker, and that will temporarily reduce the annoyance because you're hearing an outside sound instead of your internal tinnitus, but it won't heal the brain. What we're doing heals the brain by remapping the complexity that the brain needs. So tinnitus, dizziness. Um, another interesting one is chronic blocked ear. So if you have a blocked ear, it may be a cold or an infection or wax, and those things can be checked out by a doctor and treated. But if the doctor says there's nothing there, we can't see anything, there's no reason for it, nine times out of ten it will be chronic eustachian tube disorder, which is where the eustachian tube, the one that goes from the back of the throat into the middle ear, where that tube is blocked. And to give people a, a, a tangible sense of that tube, there's little exercise you can do. If you just hold your nose, block off your nose, and then try to blow through your nose, you'll feel your ears pop. You should feel your ears pop. If you don't, it means your station tube is a bit blocked. But if you do, then that means it's functioning fairly normally. And that's something you you would probably do if you're going up or down in a plane to help equalise because when you go up and down a plane, you need to equalise your middle ear pressure with the external air pressure. Otherwise, it's really stretching the eardrum and it's really painful. So that's called the Valsalva manoeuvre and it's a way of uh, just equalising that air pressure, blowing a little bit of air through the eustachian tube. Now, for people, if it's functioning normally, every time we yawn or swallow, the eustachian tube equalises. So it lets a little bit of air through, in or out, to equalise that air pressure. If you've got chronic eustachian tube disorder, that doesn't happen regularly throughout the day. And as a result, your ear constantly feels blocked and it's annoying. You may be able to clear it by doing that Valsalva manoeuvre, or you may not. And if you go around with your ear feeling blocked all the time, it's very annoying. You can't hear properly. So your hearing's muffled. You feel kind of closed in and uncomfortable inside your head. Your own voice echoes. So people have said, I couldn't sing in the choir anymore. And and I thought my hearing aids were not working properly or, you know, all this. It's just horrible to live with that all the time. Um, other people might get a lot of popping or clicking if it's continually kind of popping through the eustachian tube and not equalising properly. So it's called chronic eustachian tube disorder. It's caused by those little muscles that we talked about. Well, some different muscles, actually, the tensor veli palatini, and there's, there's five different muscles that open and close the eustachian tube normally when we yawn or swallow. And if those eustachian tube muscles are not working normally, you get that sensation of chronic or intermittent blocked ear. Well, we found out by accident that sound therapy fixed this because after we put the program out, people started writing to us and saying, I used to have this chronic blocked ear and now I don't anymore. And I can now fly in an aeroplane without my ears being blocked for weeks afterwards and all this agony and discomfort and, you know, they're working normally again. So isn't it marvellous? You exercise the ear, you stimulate the muscles, you activate the whole system and it fixes itself just like, you know, all all the muscles of the body need exercise and the muscles of the ear are no exception. So that's another thing where sound therapy has been enormously helpful, chronic eustachian tube disorder. And I'm not saying you shouldn't go to a doctor. If you have a blocked ear, it may be an infection. It may be um, wax that can be cleared by a skilled practitioner only and don't try poking things in your own ear because you can cause irreparable damage. So be careful with that. But if it's not that, and the doctor doesn't know and the audiologist doesn't know, even when they do the pressure test that they do, it doesn't show up if you've got chronic eustachian tube disorder. It shows up if you've got an ear infection blocking your ear. So <clears throat> unexplained chronic blocked ear, sound therapy is the only treatment that I've ever heard of that helps this. 
I was wondering, yeah. just as you're talking and you mentioned <laughs> how high frequency waves have a real positive uh, impact in terms of nervous system regulation and uh, helping us relax. And I, I see a lot in clinic in terms of uh, digestive disorders and typically coming from a high stress environment and that vagal tone isn't just isn't there it's it's not it's not used enough um mm -hmm. and uh you know the, so the the vagus nerve is fairly inactive and hence this person in front of me is having a lot of digestive issues as a result of high stress and so we talk about some ways in which they can help stimulate the vagus nerve and so my question is around uh, sound therapy in terms of uh, getting or reactivating that vagus nerve and helping with digestive issues. Yes, this is a huge area of application of sound therapy. I started out talking about the hearing problems, which we call natural hearing improvement, but the other massive area is treating stress. And I mentioned how for my mother, her chronic insomnia and her chronic exhaustion were resolved. And we found out along the way that people were helped with stress and anxiety and depression when they do sound therapy. And we've since found out, you know, along the way, we learned about the vagus nerve because uh, Stephen Porges did his marvellous research on polyvagal theory and discovering the very important role of the vagus nerve in calming the nervous system because as you're aware, but I don't know if your listeners are, there are there are two very important branches to the vagal nerve. There's the fight or flight branch, which um, we've all heard of. That's been around for decades. We've known about this sort of stress reaction where you go into panic and your heart races and your breathing accelerates. And that is is one branch of the vagal nerve. But the other very important branch of the vagal nerve, the ventral vagus, which only mammals have, not reptiles, is... Um, what's known as the social engagement branch of the vagal nerve. And that is the branch that causes us to feel comfortable and connected and calm. And so we have eye contact, we have rapport, we have trust. And, and when that's activated, we're in a good state. And, and as you said, digestion is better and we can relax and restore our nervous system. And Yes, it has been shown that sound therapy has a profound effect on activating the vagus nerve. And this is work done by uh, Stephen Porges. And he did this work investigating primarily, initially children with autism, which is another whole area of application for sound therapy for um, children and learning difficulties, which I can talk about also. Um, but this is a particular note with autism. And Stephen Porges did experiments where he actually was able to show that when you activate the middle ear muscles, it turns on the social engagement branch of the vagus nerve. And so it puts us naturally into a state of calm when we activate the middle ear muscles. And that's exactly what we're doing with the sound therapy. So it's a, a very natural and, and comfortable but effective way of turning on the vagus nerve. And I've seen people who you know, suffering from chronic ongoing anxiety, they do sound therapy and it's just like it switches after a few weeks of listening and they ring us up and suddenly they're calm, they're not anxious anymore, they're sleeping well, it's like a switch. It's phenomenal. So, yes, very effective treatment for that particular and, condition. And you, men you mentioned those middle ear muscles and you showed us that and I'll certainly, for the listener's sake, I'll include that uh, clip, uh, a video clip in the show notes so that the uh, listeners can uh, obviously see the ear and, and what you're demonstrating there. But those middle ear muscles, I'm thinking, why do they become inactive or, you know, you know as we know with our uh, physical you know, structure that, you know, muscles we don't use, we tend to, what they say, we lose, right? Um, yeah. And, and I'm thinking, is it because we're not using them enough because we're exposed to those low frequency waves so much uh, that those muscles are becoming fairly inactive or not, not required? Um, I, I'm just thinking, is there any work that's done as to understanding uh, what's driving this uh, lack of tone of these muscles? Yes. Um, I don't know if anyone's specifically done a study on what causes that. Uh, <clears throat> but you're absolutely right. If we don't use it, we lose it. And 
you know, I say to people, you're old enough to know at a certain point that you need to go for a walk every day to keep your whole body going, to keep all your muscles in use. And so it's the same with the ear. We need to take our ears for a walk and activate our ears. And so this is an ideal way to do that. We say it's like taking your ears to the gym. It's actually giving those muscles a workout, which sounds quite extraordinary. And people find it a bit hard to believe. I mean, first of all, they have never heard of those muscles, but then does it really work? Does it really activate the muscles? And I could I could debate this with audiologists because in their training they're not taught that sound activates those muscles. What they're taught is that the only thing that activates those muscles is a super loud sound which causes the stapedius muscle to spasm, which is true, it does. But that's because the movements are so subtle. You don't see the very subtle response and tuning of the muscles in the kind of tests that they're looking at. I know it activates the muscles because of the feedback we've had from people where some people, when they start to listen, will say, oh, my ears feel sore after listening. And that's because the muscles are working just like, you know, you take your body to the gym, you do a workout, your muscles are sore. So it's like that. And um, the fact that it treats this blocked ear, some people feel a real shift when that clears and they've described it as like a minor earthquake inside the head and then suddenly their hearing is clear. And, you know, that's got to be a muscular change because it's such a dramatic change that happens within a fairly short period of time. And there's the fact that the program must be built up gradually. So we are retraining the muscles. And, yes, you're absolutely right. We're getting the wrong diet of sound in our world today, too much loud sound, too much low-frequency sound, not enough quiet, complex, interesting, high-frequency sound to keep those muscles toned. So for musicians who are playing, you know, gentle and interesting music that's not too loud or people living in nature a lot, likely the ear would be in better shape. But as you know, as a a practitioner and, um, you know, someone who's aware of nutrition, um, and nutrition also affects our muscles. So having the right balance of minerals and and so many different nutrients that we need for our muscles and all of our body to be healthy healthy that's all important as well um and well some people just tense up their muscles don't they in response to stress it's a psychological reaction i suppose or a a biochemical reaction so in conjunction with sound therapy you know if people have chronic conditions we do sometimes also recommend gentle body work for the neck and the jaw because the muscles are all connected i've also trained in the alexander technique and learned about, you know, another kind of direct gentle stimulus for retraining the the neuromuscular system. And I'm aware from that, as anyone is who learns anatomy, that all of the muscles overlap and you don't have a muscle working in isolation. It's like a muscular suit. It's more like a wetsuit made of muscle that, that we're encased in. And if there's a problem with the ear muscles, there's often a problem with the neck muscles or the jaw muscles. And and neck and jaw tension can, of course, cause tinnitus as well. Mm. So having appropriate body work with the whole head, neck and jaw area can also help to create the environment in which the ear can function better. But it also works the other way. I've had some body workers tell me that they had a client with chronic neck and jaw tension they couldn't do anything with it they used sound therapy for a few weeks and it eased up incredibly so it works both ways and and another really interesting thing is sometimes just with a few cases there's a spontaneous improvement in posture when people use sound therapy and i suspect that's due to the 11th cranial nerve i think that's the glossopharyngeal i got that right no the spinal accessory 11th, the spinal accessory, which um, helps to control our posture and it's innovating the the neck and shoulders in this area. Now, sound therapy works on all of the cranial nerves. Well, 10 of the 12 cranial nerves are connected in some way to the ear. And so I think this explains why we see in certain people who've had a chronically stooped posture, you know, often with teenagers, for instance, um, they do sound therapy and it, it just eases up. And I'm not saying it works for everyone with the posture problem, but there have been a number of cases. It's a known uh, response to sound therapy over the years, and Dr. Tomatis talked about it, that it will sometimes just build a connection where a connection was missing. So when you remap the, the neural system, you just get all kinds of little miracles popping out. 
Yeah, and that brings me back to a, a question that I have in terms of learning difficulties. Uh, so, you know, we have kids experiencing learning difficulties. We have adults that experience learning difficulties. And obviously, you've spoken a lot about how sound therapy can enhance learning outcomes. And you particularly mentioned, you know, sound coming through the right ear. And I was thinking, you know, if students were listening to this, should they listen to their online lectures with just one earbud in their right ear to enhance the learning outcome? Anyway, that was something else that came to mind when you're talking about enhanced learning outcomes through the right ear. But my question really is around the enhanced learning outcomes for those experiencing learning difficulties mm. around sound. Yes. Well, there's a number of different ways or reasons why sound therapy helps with learning. And that right ear emphasis is definitely one of them for improving language facility. Um, when people use sound therapy, language gets easier for them. And, you know, sometimes these stories just pop into my head. A, a woman I met years ago who heard me do a brief talk on sound therapy and she came up to me and said, I definitely want to get the program because I just have trouble putting what I want to say into words. I know what I want to say and I just can't express it properly. I think this will help me. So... She got the program and she came back the next week and bought 10 programs for all her friends when she went back to England because she said, it's amazing what it's done. I just feel the connection has been made. I can now express myself. And that, because she was an adult and was able to articulate that, it really demonstrated why it is that we see children with learning difficulties. It's like a light goes on and suddenly, oh, now I can learn. I remember a, a little boy who said to his teacher years ago, I I don't understand why this was so difficult before. Now I'm finding it easy. And and I feel so sad for the children who have those language difficulties and they just can't process the information coming in and out and they struggle so much. And, and you could give them something like this and oh, then they can start from, you know, a level playing field or a bit closer to that and at least be able to process information and then they can start to learn. It's just so important and it's such an easy way to do it by putting on the headphones and waking up the auditory system. And there are many different components to the way the therapy is made that enable it to perform in this way or to, to help in this way. So that training for right ear emphasis is one very important key. The other very important key is training to respond to high frequencies because, as we mentioned, high frequency sounds are the most stimulating for the brain. They activate the brain. It's like they recharge the cortex of the brain and they actually give us brain energy. They release that latent energy in the brain and, and uh, help us to be able to process more quickly. So processing speed is a big factor in learning difficulties. If the processing speed is too slow, then the child can't learn because they can't get the letters in the right order. They can't hear that collection of complex consonants in words like spaghetti or pistachio and, and you know, actually hear the sounds to, to spell them out, to pronounce them. They just can't process quickly enough. So if you speed up the processing, then they're yards ahead. Uh, so getting the high frequency receptors activated, it's working on the receptive language. It's also working on the expressive language, it's working on the coordination, it's working on the motor skills. And this is because we're working on more than just the auditory sense. I, I wrote a book some years ago about this whole area. It's called Why Aren't I Learning? There it is. And that's also available as an ebook, or that, or that's available as a hard copy too. And um, in there, I talk about all of the different learning difficulties, ADHD, autism, dyslexia, also ear infections, um, all sorts of processing, complex processing difficulties, which, which kids are beset by, and, and we're getting better and better at diagnosing them. And there are many different treatments, but this is like the fundamental treatment that I think needs to be put in place first to correct the processing. Uh, and differences, huge differences are seen in language, in behaviour and in ability when children get this program. It normalises the sensory pathways. Oh, yes, I was going to talk about sensory integration and there's a chapter on sensory integration in the book because what that means is, you know, we've talked about the senses today, the five or seven or eight senses that bring in information from the world. Now, 
our brain has such a complex job that we have to we have to coordinate all of this information, billions of stimuli per second, to integrate the sounds we hear, what we see, the movement in space, the meaning, and smell and taste and and tactile stimulus and all of this. We've got to put it all together to make sense of the world and then choose appropriate behaviour and then learn all this complex data. I mean, it's a massive job that's expected. And if those senses are not being integrated well together and a child's struggling to process all of that, how can they function in school? And we have realised since Tomatis' work, really, but largely from his work, that the auditory sense is is really a key in helping to put together all this other sensory information because, you know, Anthony, the auditory sense is a really, really powerful sensory system. Our auditory sense registers at all three levels of the brain. Now, I'm talking about the brainstem, the midbrain, and the cortex. So the brainstem is where we process basic fundamental Um, sensory information about the world and basic body functions, swallowing, touch, breathing, heart rate, all of that. The midbrain, which is also called the mammalian brain, is where we have our limbic system and our emotional and our instinctual reactions. But it's not an awful lot of intellect going on there. And then we have the cortex, the human brain, over the whole thing, which we have so much more of that than most animals. And that's the thinking and the intellect. And sound registers at all three levels. So it shows that it's working with our fundamental integration of sensory input. The cerebellum is a really interesting part of the brain, which is right at the back near the brain stem. And it looks different. When you see a picture of the brain, you can see this thing looks like a kind of a cauliflower tacked onto the back of the brain. That's the cerebellum. And that's where it's like the male sorting room where all of the sensory information comes in and gets sorted out there and then sent to the appropriate part of the brain. And our auditory sense plays a huge role in that. And what we have realised is that what we're doing with sound therapy is we're stimulating the capacity of the cerebellum to play its role. And we're not just making a difference to the auditory sense. We see improvement in the visual sense and the tactile and the coordination as well with sound therapy. I remember a a family years ago that had a little girl who sadly had a a degenerative disorder where she was losing capacity and and becoming less able as time went on. And and they described how she would she'd walk along the hall. And there was a tiny step about an inch high to go into the first room and she'd lift her foot, a foot in the air to get over this tiny step. She just didn't have the perception of what was needed. And after she did sound therapy, she was able to correct that and do that step normally. And then she was able to sit on her little wheel push push toy and push herself along again. And so she started regaining some of the function she'd been losing when she did sound therapy. And that's just a very graphic example of how these basic functions were being restored and that's nothing to do with hearing that's spatial perception and muscular coordination so that's a foundation for learning if a child's going to learn if you can correct that sensory integration first and then work on the auditory perception they've got a chance amazing it's uh incredible in terms of uh the importance of uh sound with working with our neurological system and uh, all the uh, areas of which sound therapy can help uh, in terms of uh, support, you know, the recovery or, um, and there's a whole lot more you haven't talked about today, (laughs) um, which I'm totally aware of. And uh, so for the listeners sake, they're obviously very intrigued about the work you do. And so how can they best connect with you? Uh, Well, we've got a special um, place we'd like your listeners to go, Anthony, because we've got an offer where we'd like to send some free information to your listeners. So if they could go to mysoundtherapy.com slash podcast, mysoundtherapy.com slash podcast, they'll see a special offer there and that will lead them then into all of the other information we have. So, yes, we'd be really happy to hear from them. And, in fact, what we're offering there, the first thing we're offering is a a copy, an e-book, copy of this book, which is my first book, which my mother wrote initially, Sound Therapy, Music to Recharge Your Brain. 
And uh, 10 years later, I wrote the second half. And that's an overview of the whole sound therapy program and what's available and very interesting reads. So that will be offered when they go to that link. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that special offer. And uh, for the listeners, I'll include that link in the show notes. So you just have to go directly to the show notes, click on the link, and you'll be directed uh, to where Raphael has this special offer. And um, yeah, based on the information she shared today, I thoroughly recommend you go to those show notes and visit that link because this is opening up a whole world of learning for me and no doubt you. So uh, thank you, Raphael, for sharing your so much you have so much wisdom in this area um obviously you know 30 years of experience and endless study and um and clinic experience as well uh so you're certainly you know classified as you know a leading expert in this field so uh thank you so much and you know for being so generous with your time and imparting so much knowledge uh with the listeners today thank you so much for the opportunity anthony i really appreciate being able to speak on your podcast Oh, you're so welcome. And uh, to the listeners, thank you for tuning in for another insightful episode of Me and My Health Up. And stay tuned in for more exciting and insightful episodes of Me and My Health Up.